Welcome to the Call Up Podcast, where faith meets sport and life. Brought to you by Sports Chaplaincy South Africa. The top to Soy Wapi. Big step on the inside and the fan. So beware. Soy Wapi catches it underneath the stick. So, I've got a first today. We've got a first on the call-up podcast. This is the first time that we have had a national team captain on the <laughs> podcast. Now, okay, this you're only the 10th person to feature, but nonetheless, <laughs> this is a landmark moment for our podcast. Uh, we have had a vice captain. Uh, we had the men's pro tiers field hockey captain, uh, Keenan Horn, yeah. um, on a few months ago. And if you haven't checked that podcast out yet, I highly recommend it. Uh, Keenan just talks about how he kind of navigated the dual dream of being an, an Olympic uh, uh, hockey player, international hockey player, and pursuing his studies so that uh, he could pursue a career in law. Brilliant, brilliant uh, testimony of God's goodness and God's faithfulness. But... We have a national team captain. They seem to make them in the Eastern Cape. Um, and some of you are thinking, we've got Sierra on, but no, we've got Shakes, the captain of our uh, Blitzbocker Sevens team. And what we want to do today um, is track your rugby story, track your faith story. Um, and I think later on, do something I think is really, really crucial. And that's talk about how your faith has helped you navigate some of the lean times and tough times mm. that you've experienced more recently. Um, but before we dive in, do that deep dive today, um, got to ask you a really important question. How on earth did you end up with the name Saviwe? <laughs> Welcome to the podcast, by the way. Thank you very much, Bruce. Uh, yeah, it's a massive honor for me to sit here today. And um, as you mentioned, I think there's really been individuals that have made a name for themselves in sports that have been in this position. So I don't take it lightly at all. Um, yeah, for me, I'm from the Eastern Cape and um, you would guess then that um, since my name is Siviwe, that I'm Kosa. So um, in Kosa, Siviwe means our prayers were heard. It actually means we were heard and wow. my parents were referring to the prayers that they had been praying to God uh, for a boy. So I'm um, a boy amongst three sisters and they were praying for a boy and their prayers were answered. Wow. And my prayers, our prayers have been answered <laughs> because we've been waiting a little while to get you on this podcast. So, um, um, but that's one of the beautiful things that, you know, as a pommy, uh, living in South Africa for the last 14 years, I think one of the things I really love about many of our cultures here is just the significance mm. behind the naming yeah. uh, of children. There's something really beautiful. And actually that aligns with the scriptures, you know, in the Hebrew scriptures, people are given names for a reason. Yes, absolutely. Uh, there's a real purpose um, behind those names. But uh, uh, just tell us a little bit more about your background growing up. I know from our conversations previously, um, you know, pretty humble background, um, and your mother was a woman of faith. Just, just yeah. tell us a little bit more about life growing up in the Eastern Cape. Yeah, a small town in Maclear, uh, born in Mtata, uh, obviously because Maclear never really had a hospital to have uh, mothers deliver their babies. So we had to travel about an hour to, yeah. to get to St. Mary's Hospital, where I was born. I uh, grew up in Maclear. I went to Maclear Primary School and um yeah it's it was it's a small farm town close to roads uh the other uh, towns that are around there is yugi elliot barclay east and um maybe i'll maybe people will know Alwa north which is very close to bloemfontein um yeah i think being there in primary school um, you're not exposed to much you don't have a lot of resources you're quite mm -hmm. content with that um life at that level and um yeah i mean we had family close by in the villages that surround my clear my cousins lived in a village called engolosi my my mom uh, my mom's uh, homestead as well was pretty close which was in bandela 
um, my dad as well, um, right next to Yugi, which was a Kakala. So pretty much, um, as you said, humble beginnings, uh, village life, small town boy. Um, luckily, we had like sports that I was exposed to pretty young. My dad was a football coach. He coached. Okay. He coached. Um, he coached uh, Jomo Cosmos while when they were still based in um, Tata. Did he really? He did. He did. So, so that 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 <clears throat> begs a, a, a big question because. Does that explain why you've got the name Shay? Because that's that's a name definitely associated with soccer, right? Absolutely. Um, the actually the name itself it comes from the comic book uh, Super Strikers. So yeah, yeah, the star player of the of the comic is Shakes. And when we used to travel, myself and my dad would leave the girls at home, go on his football trips where he had games. I'd travel with him, he'll buy himself a newspaper. In that newspaper, there will be that comic book, which I became very fond of. I started reading it and I, I fell in love with this main character called Shakes. And the the, um, the boys who my dad coached, they, they caught on to it and they started calling me Shakes because of that. And the comic is all about football and um, being in a football team yeah i actually thought i'd play soccer this day. Well, that, <laughs> that that leads itself really nicely into this question because how on earth there's a, a gossip boy who um lives in a, a rural part of the country whose father is a, a soccer coach and you get the nickname shakes after a, a fictional cartoon character um in a in a in a soccer cartoon book end up playing rugby <laughs> um yeah it was it was god's plan i guess because <laughs> i honestly <laughs> i also thought I'd, I'd end up in soccer um i mean everything i did we traveled from mcclear to tata mcclear to east london we'd go to kzn to play fixtures we'd play in matati we we traveled a lot and i was around a football team i was around uh, soccer players my dad all he watched was was soccer he tried to get me into it um but at my school in my clear primary school there was no soccer and most of my time i spent in my clear he would get up drive to solo which is nearby he'd run his business he had a taxi and um after school then that means while he's working i'm at school after school i need to do my extra murals that's how they kept me out of trouble i did my extra murals ended up doing everything but there was no football so yeah there was rugby at at the school at the time and i was basically playing rugby as an extra mural activity i didn't even think i'd play rugby Never. But football wasn't an option, so... Football wasn't an option, and to actually carry on the rugby story is a, a good friend of mine. We were best friends. Uh, we grew up together in Maclea. His name is uh, Umil. He actually lives in Cape Town as well. He played... He was crazy about rugby. We... He had DSTV at his house, so we would go watch rugby at his house. That's that's all he he watched as well. He followed rugby religiously. He knew all the Springboks um, from back in the days. He knew all the All Blacks from back from back in the days. So he actually taught me a lot about rugby itself. He played rugby Craven Week under thirteen when he was um, eleven. He played Craven Week under thirteen when he was twelve. He played wow. Craven Week under thirteen when he was thirteen. Three years in a row, and I just for me I had this burning desire to. To join him at some stage i mean we played in the same team but i just never cracked it at, at a provincial level and um yeah he his dad saw that he was actually achieving so much in the game and he he wanted to send him to a boys school and a rugby playing school uh, a, a school with a rugby culture he his dad lived in king williamstown for for work so in King, where Dale College is, Dale College, yeah. is where his dad um, got um, introduced to a, a rugby-loving man called uh, Figula Blau. And Figula Blau, who was our coach at a stage as well, under 15, 
he gave um, Craven's dad. <laughs> Akumile ended up being called Craven because he played Craven for so long. <laughs> <laughs> and um, he gave Craven's dad um, the application forms. Craven wanted to go to the boarding school, but he wanted to go with me. We were close. We were close and we did everything together. So he wanted me to come with and we couldn't afford it. So we, we knew we couldn't afford it. So I took the forms to my parents though. And they are. It so, 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 so how did the door open at Dale? The, my mom just said, God will make a way. We'll apply. We will apply at Dale and God will make a way. Wow. She told me that she does not have the money or the finances to pay for my school fees. And you said something really interesting right at the, the, the top here. You said, you know, it was clearly part of God's plan. And I'm already getting a sense of thing. Anybody <laughs> listening to this is getting a sense of that. Yeah. You know, of course, the boy, rural area, football family, but the only extra mural at your school is, is rugby. Then you've got this friend who's really gifted, really talented. Mm -hmm um and and his father has aspirations for him but you're kind of in his shadow yeah. and uh and somehow i guess miraculously mm. you know a, a door opens for you at dale it did i think the people that we meet and the people that we end up um being the closest to god always has a reason for that mm. and funny enough craven today is successful in his own right. He studied hard. He was ab incredibly clever. Um, and he's an accountant today. That's what he wanted to do. So, so he became an accountant and you went on to become a professional rugby player. So at what point, obviously you've now got access to real opportunity, um, but you still have to take that opportunity. At yeah. what point did you go, hold on? I can maybe make a career out of this. To be honest with you, as in primary, as I said, I took it as an extramural activity. Um, there was something burning inside of me to actually pursue it or actually just enjoy it, enjoy mm -hmm. the game of rugby when Craven was um, just bringing something different to the small little town where he would go on, 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 a, on, a, on a Craven week to go and, and, and participate. That was massive for us. Mm. That was something that we never saw. We we spent weekends, we spent weekdays, we spent holidays in Maclear. So for someone to travel and say, I am going to Port Elizabeth to play at the Craven Week was something. It's like going to another country. It was just <laughs> like going to another country. So um, yeah, it was something that uh, opened up my eyes, but going to Dell, Listen, I think Dale was a rugby school, still is today. And sometimes I would think that does this school even offer any classes or any form of education because of how rugby crazy they were. And being there at boarding school, the bug absolutely bit me and I fell in love with rugby at Dale College. Mm -hmm. I enjoyed playing. That's all I was doing. Just being part of the atmosphere of the school of the rivalries of um just being exposed to the game throwing the ball around mm -hmm. exercising and just being in a team environment that was something that i was drawn towards mm -hmm. i never i still didn't make a provincial side at dale at a 16 a grand como level nothing wow. i still had those aspirations while i was there because now i'm even more in love with the game but I'm still not cracking it. The one time that I actually think that made the difference was when I went for trials in my grade 11 year and I didn't make the team again. So all yeah, those- I mean, This is really unusual because generally speaking, <clears throat> if you're gonna make it at a Lehigh performance level, oh, yeah. you're, you're, you're usually cracking it at provincial level yeah as a bare minimum absolutely and you're telling me a very different story here that's true that's true i i never cracked it yeah. from under 13 level under 16. so you got the passion you got the opportunity god's opened the door for you but it's not happening it's there but i guess 
there's different paths for 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 different people and and as i sit here today i i think of uh, another uh, man of god that i know is a good friend his name is lizo lizo popoka and he never played rugby until he was 16 years old mm. and now he is he's actually a springbok mm. he's a springbok he's now based in cape town he plays for the stormers currently mm. injured but i know that Path pathways are different for each and every sports person and individual. Yeah. So, yeah, and, and it's really interesting. We had Ricky Steenkamp, uh, now retired um, um, hurdler, and and she never won her first race. I think she'll correct me if I'm wrong. Until she was about sixteen. Yeah. And yet she had this burning passion to be a runner from like six or seven. Yeah. Um, she didn't even win any any significant race until she was like 16 17 which is which is pretty remarkable and then goes on to be national champion for a decade and national record holder and amazing you know won a world cup event at the london olympic stadium you know yeah. and and it's crazy isn't it like you say and everybody has their own everybody has their own journey their yes. own story and somebody can be ahead of you yes absolutely and and, and years later um they they have a different story from you um, absolutely. so you have to stay in your lane don't you? yeah i know like, it's so you know eventually you do turn pro um now i'm trying to get this right because the names change so often like eastern kings southern kings yeah, yeah. um eastern elephant i i get really confused but you you know you eventually finish school turn yeah. turn pro but i've got to ask you this question because i you know when when we've chatted briefly you know that actually that was a real challenge for you wasn't it um you were brought up in a home with Christian values, but I think when we when we get access to money, yeah, to a little bit of fame, um, and girls, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> right. There's yeah. you know there's 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 greater temptation, yeah. You know, um, I mean, the three great idols are sex, money, and power, yes. and celebrity. Yes, um, is 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 a form of power. Power, yeah and um you know those idols those idols demand our lives and what yes. we give our lives to is is ultimately what we become yes um you brought up in a christian home with christian values but then you arrive in this space how did you handle that um just just the pathway to f to give people insight and understanding was eventually i got the call up from an injured player in the under 19 in under 18 academy week team okay so i eventually made the provincial side playing at an academy level or playing for the b team of the academy of the provincial side so from there we played in in the free in the in kzn a little town called Frey 8. we competed there we actually did well from there uh there were a few scouts and 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 a lot of interest was um was sparked from getting that opportunity now all of a sudden i have these options to be able to go to a, a, a ep kings academy so i could have gone to durban i could have gone to pretoria my parents um again intervened and were like why don't i do something where i can study as well yeah be at the university of the Nelson Mandela yeah. University and and be close to home as well yeah. within the Eastern Cape. So I went that route and boom, you have a contract. You you your life has changed yeah. dramatically. Your profile's changed. Your profile has changed. Balance changed. <laughs> now you have money of your own. <laughs> <laughs> that needs to do a lot of things for other people, but you still have money of your own. Yeah. So and to answer your question um port elizabeth for me was a the city of lights i mean from where you've come from it's a big city i mean if you're moving from joburg or durban or cape town you go then you go this is a bit sleepy <laughs> <laughs> absolutely for me as you said it was like going to another country yeah i mean we only went to the beach at the end of the year in december where we would really look forward to that as a family and now I woke up and I saw the beach from my window, which was an, a, a dramatic, drastic change in my life. And yeah, being part of the, the rugby academy and being in university, there's a lot of, there's a lot of other students, female students. There's, there's 
the temptation of girls, as you mentioned, and you have a contract, you mentioned money as well. Um, you got a bit more money than some of the other students, right? Absolutely. And now, all of a sudden, since there's this connection between the, the club and the school, you've got almost preferential treatment because yeah. you can't be in university the whole day. You have certain times that you come in being part of the the class, but still doing what mm. you do. And the other students notice this, that it's it's almost a different life compared to them. Yes, you're a student, but it's so different. And I think I'll be I'll be honest with you. Um, I I just went with the flow at the time. I went with the friends. What friends did in the team, um, they enjoyed themselves. We we worked hard. We really trained hard. We started our days at five o'clock in the gym, be at class at eight, train on the um, have a, a lecture in the morning and train in the afternoon, back to res to study. And then eventually I moved out of res. I was part of, uh, now I lived at the, at the academy house. And there it got worse because um, it's the freedom of being in your own space and just your teammates. Um, yeah, so weekends we would, we would go out with those clubs. I'd never seen a club in my life and we'd go out to clubs and see something different, loud music, lights, um, so many people. Um, yeah, so to answer that question, I think at the time I, I, I went with the crowd and um, I just did what my teammates did. That's yeah. that's all I knew. So you fitted in with the crowd? I fitted in with the crowd. Yeah. You, uh, you weren't your own thermostat. You no. decided to be a thermometer <laughs> and you'd go where the temperature was, right? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. So what happened? I mean, you know, how did the prodigal get back home? <laughs> um, you know, I, the foundation that was laid for myself back home, um, by my, by my parents and my mom, um, it's something that stuck with me. And even while you're going out, you have so much guilt you feel so guilty just for going out but you really want to experience it um you 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 know what's right and what's wrong and that rings in your head daily so you were brought obviously in taste and see that the lord is good but i said i haven't tasted this before <laughs> so i'm going to give it a go absolutely it's just like that that constant uh, fight of the flesh versus yeah. the spirit daily and the flesh was winning absolutely yeah. winning that fight yeah um, so yeah, I think I was there 2012, 2013, 2014, I, again, things were going well. I started, I got a, a call up early to play for the senior team, played super rugby at 21 Wow! and, um, it just got worse. But for me, there was always like a void or again this this feeling i had which call it guilt or call it whatever it is but i just knew that this is not the life i want to live yeah it's your conscience yeah it's 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 the holy spirit reminding you what's real yes and what's true yeah and i had to make a decision for myself hmm. that's yeah. when i had to I was ignoring the Holy Spirit mm. and there came a time when I couldn't ignore that voice anymore mm. and I had to make a decision for myself. Remember yeah. that that foundation that was laid was just a foundation yeah. and it was, it was my mom's, I think I know she even says it today that this is what she wanted for her kids. But it wasn't something that we wanted for ourselves. Mm. It was still a decision that we would still have to make for ourselves. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I, I guess you were in that stage where you were beginning to gain the whole world. But as Jesus said, forfeiting your soul. Absolutely. But you came back home. You surrendered. Absolutely. <laughs> you gave it and you waved the white flag and said, that's it. I've had enough. Yeah. My pastor from my youth pastor from McClear, his name's Stephen still really close to me today um 
he invited me to a summer camp that year, 2014. And um, we always used to go while I was in primary as well. And I hadn't gone because I moved to the big city now. So I was spending time in different... <laughs> I became I became a different person. I'm, I'm, I'm not coming back home as much. I'm not in the church as much as I used to be. Um, so Pastor Stephen, for some weird reason, we never spoke that much that year. But he just rang me up and he said, the summer camp this year, same time of the year, at the end of the year, why don't you join us? And with the year that I had, I felt like God was just finding a way to reach out to me. And he used that channel. Yeah. At summer camp, 15th of December, 2014, I gave my life to the Lord. I made the decision for myself. 15th of December. 15th of December. I'm going to remember that day. So your 10th, your 10th born again birthday was this year. <laughs> it's this year. Yeah. It's 10 years this year in December. Yeah. See, God never lets go of his children, right? Never. Yeah. Never. And yeah. as I said, the people that you end up, that end up in your path, God uses those people. Yeah. Because yeah. Pastor Stephen was that person for me that got the prodigal back home. <laughs> yeah. And he probably doesn't even know how why he ended up inviting you, but that's just the way the Holy Spirit works, right? Absolutely. You know, so praise God for that. Look, I want to jump on. I mean, that's 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 a beautiful part of your story, and we wouldn't be sitting here right now. Yeah. So it's really important that we talked about that. And there'll be athletes and others who, who are maybe listening to this, and they know that... Uh, Deep down inside, actually, the way they're living their lives, it's not right. Mm. It doesn't line up. Something inside them, whether it's the good seed of the gospel that was so, sown in younger years, mm. or whether it's just their conscience. Yeah. You know, they're made, we're all made in the image of God. Yeah. And something always tells us, you know, this isn't what we're made for. This isn't really satisfying. Um, and my prayer is that, you know, maybe somebody who listens to this, and is in that plan as well. Mine you as know, well. yeah. Um, you know, we'll know that actually there's a father calling them back home. Absolutely. You know, the the prodigal doesn't have to stay lost. No, no, no. Uh, and God's ready to to, <laughs> to throw a big party and say, "Hey, welcome back." The Call Up Podcast, where faith meets sport and life. This is brought to you by Sports Chaplaincy South Africa. The power of his dream brings you here. LIA Productions.